15 more seconds till one. So let's give, let's give them 15 more seconds. Oh, that's good. Magic. Look, we're getting more people. (laughs) Good afternoon. This is Lewis. Good afternoon. Secretary Fielder, is there anyone else on your team uh, that you're waiting for that you want us to hold off for? Uh, No, we're good. Okay. All right, well, I guess I can call us to order then at 1 p.m. on the nose. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us here. Uh, Lord knows the last month has been very tough for a bunch of us for a whole lot of reasons and no reason to litigate all of that. Let me just say that um, sometimes I feel like when I watch the news, um, it doesn't feel like what I'm watching is exactly public service as I uh, imagined it when I was growing up. And I'm just so very, very thankful for this opportunity to get to work alongside all of you um, and feel like I'm getting the chance to contribute to you know, the public good in the state and these uh, institutions of higher education. And uh, just thankful to be with you and Dr. Fielder and his team and even doing our little part here. It feels like it's making the world a little bit better despite all the stuff floating around us. So thank you to all of you for giving me the chance to do this. Dr. Fielder. Uh, yes, sir. Well, well good afternoon. And, and first thing is, as chairman has already said, thank you very much for your service and your commitment to public service. And uh, many of you, your backgrounds in, involve a lot of education, mentoring, and legacies that you've already created. And this certainly <clears throat> stands out in the pandemic uh, for those individuals that do step forward and help us get through this. Um, needless to say, the last last year, 2020, seemed like it was 10 years long to me. Um, sometimes I think it was 15, and I, you know, the days blur together, but you still keep the, the agenda moving. And speaking of agenda, the le- legislative session has already started. The first bill in the House was introduced by uh, Speaker Adrian uh, Jones, and it has to do with the a uh, coalition case being settled uh, with a fiscal note of $557 million paid out over 10 years, starting in fiscal year 23. So uh, a couple of the updates that happened uh, with the bill originally had a $9 million minimum that each of the four institutions would receive per year. And that's been changed, to, uh, I'm sorry, 7 million to, to 9 million as a floor. Secondly, was the fiscal year was changed, so it's pushed out to fiscal year 23. Um, one of the aspects of the, the bill that remain unchanged, very much we're supportive of the bill, but you know, really can't go out far uh, in front of the governor on this, is it requires that the budget create 10 positions, new position within MHEC to be able to handle the additional workload that the HBCUs will be submitting new academic programs to create their unique um, niche markets. So that was House Bill 1. Senate Bill 1 was a companion bill. But both those bills are, are we're watching. We're also watching a couple that we're hearing for today on amendments to the uh, foster and homeless youth scholarships and tuition waivers and amendments to the Promise um, scholarship bills and Richard Collins scholarship bill. So there's right up front a good bit of activity on higher ed with um, discussions about how the impact of the pandemic has been harder on those that are first generation students um, or minority less than represented students. So that's a quick call on what's going on in Annapolis and within our department the staff has done phenomenal in being able to switch and pivot to become all online and functioning from scholarships through academic programs review through budgets through everything that we do now is pretty much online and continuing to look at IT changes to further support and make things more transparent. Um, that would be my real quick uh, report, Mr. Chair. If you want to move ahead to the minutes. Great, thank you very much for all of that. Um, yeah, unless anyone has any questions about uh, the secretary's comments, uh, is there a, anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes from the December meeting? I so move. I'll second. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion, questions, comments about the minutes? 
All right, hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes, say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Okay, um, it appears unanimous to me. Uh, let me know if I got that wrong. I think next up on the agenda is the committee updates. Uh, Emily, do I turn this over to you, especially for the creation of the new committee and trying to organize uh, those meetings? Uh, sure, I can just provide a brief update that we've been trying to schedule a uh, education policy committee meeting uh, based on the doodle poll. I think we will be scheduling that for February 1st uh, in the afternoon. So I will circulate uh, an agenda, get that posted to our website uh, as it is a public meeting um, and confirm that with all the commissioners. Uh, I'm just waiting on one more response, uh, but it looks like February 1st. Uh, we do have a couple of items that uh, need to go before the Education Policy Committee, and I will also provide a number of updates uh, for the good of the group. And I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Fielder, anything else on the score? Uh, no. Okay. Um, any members on the committee front? If not, we can press ahead. Um, so. Dr. Fielder, I guess there are just a handful of uh, reports starting with the Department of Finance and Administration. And yes, they're information only. Um, we're trying to keep the, the meetings as direct and short as possible and leave as much room for people if they have other questions. So uh, first, uh, let me call on Jeff. Uh, yeah. Finance and administration. And I'm going to actually turn it over to Dan Schuster. He's going to uh, discuss the uh, Fiscal 2023 Community College Construction Grant Program, the state and local cost sharing formula, which should only take a couple seconds. Uh, th th thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, just a, a brief item. We are kicking off actually the uh, FY23 budget uh, process with this item. And what happens is uh, the colleges have to submit to us their budget request by July for the FY23 cycle. And so in the next couple of months, they need to get with their, uh, with their local funders and make sure that they have uh, their cost estimates and their local uh, funding commitments in place in order to submit that to us in time. And so in order to do that, we have to let them know what is going to be the state share uh, for their projects for uh, FY23 cycle. And that share will carry through for those projects uh, for however many years they get uh, funding for that project. If the initial funding is FY23, it'll be that state share percentage and that'll carry forward to 24 and 25 if they get additional funding. Um, and so the way that we go about uh, uh, determining that uh, what that level is going to be is uh, we use a formula that the Department of Education uh, uses to figure out the financial assistance uh, uh, at the county level uh, for public education. And that formula includes uh, factors um, uh, related to the county's wealth, such as income and property values. And it also includes factors related to the enrollment of uh, students in primary and secondary education in those counties. So we go through that formula, uh, figure out the percentage in uh, each county, and then we have to make adjustments for our program. Our program calls for uh, a minimum of 50% state uh, share for uh, the community college projects that are capital eligible. And also, uh, it includes for any regional colleges, colleges that serve more than one county, they have to have 75% uh, state share. And so we do the calculation uh, using the, the uh, Department of Education formula, and we make the adjustments upward to 50% if it, if it comes out below that number. And then we change the uh, regional colleges to 75%. Uh, to uh, comply with uh, regulation. And so on page two of the memo, you can see what the amounts are for uh, the FY23 cycle for each of the 15 community colleges. As a reminder, Baltimore City does not participate in this program because as a state uh, run agency, the state pays for 100% of all of its capital projects. 
And so uh, the other 15 colleges uh, do participate in the program and that's the level that the state would fund them uh, for their eligible expenses in FY23. Uh, that number, although it does change from year to year, it doesn't change too much from any one year to the next. It usually changes less than 1% up or down. And that was the case again this year. So that's about it. After this, uh, later this week, I'll be uh, sending notification to the colleges uh, with these numbers so that they can um, plan appropriately. And with that, I will take any questions that you have. I'm, I'm sorry, like, I, I'm going to be embarrassed by asking this. So um, on that chart in uh, that you just discussed, it has the percentages. Uh, yes. I, I'm just not understanding the percentage of state share. So for Allegheny, College of Maryland, the 70.2 percent that represents 70.2 percent of the total capital. Uh, so, yeah, so what will happen is uh, when if Allegheny County submits a project that the state is going to fund in FY23, uh, the state will determine how much of that project is uh, is uh, eligible for capital funding of the state. So say it's five million dollars, then the state will pay 70.2 percent of that five million dollars and Allegheny, either the county or sometimes the college has uh, funds at its disposal that it can use, but there has to be a local match. Uh, in that case, it would be, uh, you know, that 29.8 percent or whatever would be the local match that they would have to pay. And so they have to come up with that commitment before they uh, as they submit the project request to us. Thank you. And so does that mean if Allegheny College had three different capital projects, the state would cover 70.2% of each of those? Or is yes. that like a... it, Yes. If the state was going to fund that many projects, uh, you know, they started with their initial funding in FY23, that would be true. Um, it's not likely that that would happen, but yes, that would be the case if they did. Great. Thank you so much. Any and, other questions? And um, let me ask uh, if you'd explain a little bit different. How does the state determine whether it's 50% or 70% or 65%? What, how is that determination made? So the 75% is easy. That's all of the regional colleges, uh, all of the colleges that serve more than one county get to 75%. So like Wardwick College of Southern Maryland, uh, so on. So that's 75 percent. Now, the other part is determined. We use the uh, we use the uh, Department of Education formula that it uses to determine uh, how much uh, funding should be for uh, 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 education projects for the state of Maryland. And so we use their same formula, which that formula includes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, factors related to uh, the wealth of the county and so the wealthier counties will get uh, will get less funding and it also includes those factors related to the number of students that are in the counties and so if the counties have more students that they have to take care of they will get more funding for example and so that's Thank you, Dan. I think that helps clarify because when you look at the table, you'll see that the wealthier counties um, still receive a 50% match as is more of the minimum that the state has to do. Right. One of the other things that we've been watching carefully is the enrollment at the community colleges has continued to decrease. The pandemic has um, magnified those decreases. If you look at it the other way on the operational funding, uh, Jeff could point out that in the last five years, the per student funding appropriation has increased over 50%. But that's a reflection of the decreases in enrollment, not a you know, tremendous increase in appropriations. And so the, all those things fold together when you're doing the capital review, because if, you're if your number of students are going down, it's potential that you don't need as much construction for new other than renovations. So it's all tied together. Dan joined us uh, now, gosh, 18 months ago. I'd have to 
try to remember. The beard looks good, Dan, but <laughs> the, uh, so he's done a great job of getting on top of all these details. I have a quick question, um, Dan. This is Commissioner Jackson. I'm wondering, um, you talked about the colleges having to have a, um, a get a financial commitment, I guess, for their portion of the support for these projects. Have you um, historically seen any instances when um, they had once um, obtained a financial commitment, but that fell through and there had to be some other adjustments made? And if so, how was that made? Well, uh, normally that doesn't happen. Um, and uh, as uh, the secretary just said, I'm, I'm new here, so I, I don't really have that much history to go back to. Uh, but what I can say is looking in, in the past projects, uh, that would be a rare occurrence. Uh, usually once the project gets started and underway on uh, the state uh, uh, commits to its share of the funding, the county is going to continue to uh, do that as well. Um, and that is especially true once the construction starts. So typically uh, what happens with these projects is the first commitment will be toward the design uh, phase of the project and then if uh, you know the larger projects they won't get the construction until later and there are instances sometimes where for example they start the design phase find out that it's too much money in the uh, economy tanks or whatever and the project will uh, the request will be pulled but uh, typically that doesn't happen um, usually what happens is they don't even request it until they uh, do get the commitment from the local level. Um, and then um, and, and it's only after that that they submit their request to the state. Um, I, just as a follow-up, I only ask that question because we're in unusual times. And, um, and I'm wondering whether or not, you know, consideration has been given for how adjustments would be made. Um, I know there's shortfalls throughout the state in terms of budgets and obviously um, even if we look at the private sector um, it's heavily impacted so that's that's just my only question and concern um, i might be able to add a little bit to that the, the capital side of the budget is funded by state bonds and that's why the state's bond rating at a triple a um, is the highest rating and those bonds you know were typically 30-year bonds and so when there's a pledge for the state on the capital side the money is committed for a period of years to finish the construction. The operating budget, you know, each year that when we go through and we hit these, the pandemic, the downturn, the revenue, that's where the real cuts come. I don't know whether that helps explain it a little bit better. And also with um, the state capital planning process, we, we plan on a five-year uh, time frame. So, um, the colleges and the state are working together to uh, look at what's being planned for future years as well as current years. Um, there have been a rare, rare occasions where, um, for whatever reason, a college has not had uh, its planning uh, put together in time to receive state funding in the um, in the year that they expected it and money can be shifted because it is a, a grant it's a grant program for all community colleges except for baltimore city so there can be adjustments made to move the funding or, or hold off on funding for that particular project um, for a future year helpful thank you very much do any other commissioners have questions or comments about this All right, well, thank you to you both for the presentation. Um, Dr. Fielder, anything else or should we move along? No, I would say let's move on to Dr. Dow has a couple um, informational items, reports. Welcome, Dr. Dow, thank you. Thank you, good afternoon, commissioners, good afternoon, Chair. Um, I, for this first report on medical assisting, I'm gonna turn the time over to our Director of Academic Affairs, Trish Gordon-McCown, um, and she will walk through the information. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dow. So the first memo is the final policy change for rescinding restrictions 
on medical assisting and nursing assistant programs at private career schools. This can be found on pages eight through 10 of your commission books. Effective February 1st, 2021, the Maryland Higher Education Commission will rescind the program restrictions for medical assistant, assisting and certified nursing assistant currently open to Northwestern Maryland region only. This decision was made in response to the recent call for public comments and feedback regarding the current restrictions for specific programs offered at private career schools in October 2020. As stated in our previous announcement, MHEC placed a restriction on medical assistant, medical assisting, and certified nursing assistant programs offered at a private career school that did not meet regulatory requirement for market demand under COMAR 13B-010105. The initial determination for restrictions on these programs was made in 2015 using data and reports regarding Maryland's workforce supply and demand. At the time, these reports demonstrated there was a limited or no job market demand for graduates of these programs and that there was a volume of academic programs for these fields that outnumbered the potential employment opportunities. However, in light of several recent school closures that offered these programs and the current COVID health pandemic requiring the immediate need for skilled healthcare workers, we determined these programmatic restrictions could no longer be substantiated. We have collaborated with multiple state agencies, including the Maryland Department of Health, the Maryland Board of Nursing, MBON, the Maryland Department of Labor, um, all to determine current market, current market demand for healthcare workers. In accordance with the governor's declaration on catastrophic health emergency and the Maryland Department of Health's directive and order regarding various vaccination matters, MHEC is responding to the statewide need to increase the number of eligible licensed and certified healthcare workers. The Maryland Board of Nursing submitted letters of support on September 9th, 2020, and again on January 6, 2021, to lift the restrictions on the nursing assistant programs. In addition to the letters of support, MHEC received a letter opposing rescinding the current program alerts for both programs. This response came from the Maryland Community College Association of Continuing Education and Training, also known as MCASIT. This collective body of community college continuing education representatives, along with their allied health advisory group, asserted all of the 16 community colleges provide training in the certified nursing assistant credential. In addition, the colleges provided both credit, the, the colleges provide both credit and non-credit options for medical assisting. After careful consideration of the current healthcare pandemic, statewide market demand projections, education and training resources, MHEC has determined it is necessary to remove the statewide program alerts for occupational training that leads to medical assistant, medical assisting, and certified nursing assistant or geriatric nursing assistants. MHEC will continue to consider market demand and existing programs when reviewing applications for new institutions and academic proposals for new programs. This item is for informational purposes only. I will stop here for any questions or comments. I just have a process question, which is, I want to make sure that I understand like how this order of operations goes. So these are programs or institutions that had been already approved, but then you suspended their ability to provide to continue working, uh, issuing um, the certifications, diplomas in this area because of market demand. But then when market demand went back up, you took back the rescission or you took back the limitation. Is that right? Um, no, actually, and thank you for the question. Um, to clarify, the program alerts are put onto any training that is deemed saturated in the state. 
Um, and in this case, there's uh, market demand was, um, there was not enough market demand to continue allowing institutions to apply to offer the training. So these are for a new institution seeking to offer this occupational training. So no programs that were currently approved were impacted. We just halted new applicants at the private career schools. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome, sir. Uh, other questions, comments, thoughts? It's just, it, this change does not involve physician assistants, does it? No, it does not, Dr. Boyd. It's just for the medical assistants and CNA, GNA. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the way these regulations work are uh, MHEC staff is approved when it notices this market saturation to kind of um, put the kibosh on additional providers and then MHEC staff can make the decision of rescinding that order. That doesn't require additional action from the <clears throat> commission on either side, right? No, it does not. <laughs> It's a review that continuously goes on as we review applicants and um, the market projections that we get from Department of Labor are for a 10 year period of time. So we generally review that um, to make sure that we have sufficient room for new applicants. And if I can add that this has been motivated uh, by kind of two things. We've had a number, so this, this decision was done in 2015, as, as uh, Trish noted. Uh, since then, we've had a number of school closures uh, that uh, had large populations of students going through these programs. Couple that with the pandemic and need for allied health professionals. Uh, we, we were looking at this uh, to begin with and the pandemic kind of motivated it even further that we needed to remove the uh, the pro prohibition for these kinds of programs to operate in Maryland. So, just a moment, Dr. Now, would then these um, uh, individuals be participating in the vaccination process? I'm just just curious. Uh, would they be able to support, you know, the, the distribution and um, of vaccinations? Uh, most likely, uh, yes. Uh, it it depends on yeah, vaccination protocol at the time. Uh, realistically, it, it takes quite a bit of time for a private career school to get up and running. We have a list of, of private career schools that we have denied operating because of this program alert. Uh, we will alert those private career schools that we're seeking to operate in light of this change. We will alert them and say, okay, we now I've reevaluated the saturation. We see that there is a need. You can reapply. That reapplication process often takes at minimum four to six months, if not longer, um, to get space, to get staff, to get up and running. Uh, but nonetheless, we we are hearing from the health uh, industry that uh, there's going to be quite an influx and uh, quite an aftermath of changes in staffing needs uh, for the next several years. It's good. And it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fielder, anything else on this? Do you think we need to be apprised of? I uh, know. I think that uh, just a couple of quick comments that when, when you're trying to look at workforce needs and knowing that it takes a, a period of time to ramp these up, and then when you look in the market and see the severe changes that have occurred, um, on the companion side within MHEC, we have workforce shortage scholarships. So we try to do some things the other way. So it's not just uh, saying to an institution, you can no longer offer these degrees because there's no jobs for the individuals at the end of the degrees. And that seems you know, very harsh on the students, especially the parents that pay for the private career tuitions to have a, a graduate um, without any potential help for job. That's that was the original driver in 15, and now we're at the opposite end of that. You know, there's a tremendous need, and so how do you spur and encourage these things forward? And they need to be done as swiftly as we can. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gordon McCown, and thank you, Dr. Dow, for that. Much appreciated. Uh, should we move on to the next informational item? Uh, sure. This one's a, a complex one. Um, 
in, in Trish, you know, Bryson is on, I think. So Bryson is the one who's been tasked with performing these uh, non-public institutional reviews for the last year. The piece of legislation was passed now just over a year ago, it's the first year of implementation, and it's been quite burdensome for the institutions to prepare as well as for our staff to review. So Trish, or is it Emily? It's, it's me this time, <laughs> with, with Trish Sorry. as my backup. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, that's okay, thank you. Um, so just as Secretary Fielder mentioned, this is our first review. Uh, due to legislation passed in 2018, we recently conducted the first review of non-public institutions that either operate in Maryland or provide distance education to Maryland residents. Uh, so this review included 54 institutions. We have completed the review of all the institutions with the exception of five, and I think actually the most up-to-date number is with the exception of four because we drafted this memo, and then I think we approved one in the past few days, but nonetheless, there we are. Um, all institutions for which we have completed the review have been classified as nonprofit. And that is the purpose of this review, is to classify non-public institutions as either non-profit or for-profit institutions. So the review requires institutions to identify reportable incidents, meaning financial transactions that involve board members, officers, or their family members. MHEC then reviews those reportable incidents to determine if they constitute private inurement, meaning a transaction that primarily benefits private interests instead of the institution's educational interests. 20 of the 50 institutions had at least one reportable incident. Most institutions had either one or two reportable incidents. Five institutions had more than two reportable incidents with one institution having 23 reportable incidents. So in total, staff reviewed 63 reportable incidents across 20 institutions. The most common reportable incidents, these financial transactions found during this reporting period include things like employment of family members as faculty or staff, tuition rem remission for family members, uh, housing or relocation loans to senior administrators, or contracts or leases involving companies in which a trustee or their family member has an ownership in. Uh, so these contracts were for a variety of purposes, including online education platforms, administrative services, construction, investment management, janitorial services, and just some general consulting. Upon reviewing a reportable incident, staff will make a preliminary finding that the transaction either does or does not constitute that private inurement, that it benefits somebody uh, over the institution's educational interests. If a staff member makes a preliminary finding of no private enrollment, staff will consult with the Consumer Protection Division of the Office of Attorney General before making a final finding that a reportable incident does not constitute private enrollment. So 18 classification submissions have been referred to Consumer Protection. Consumer Protection has returned 17 of those submissions to MHAC. One remains under review. And to date, uh, consumer protection has not disagreed with any preliminary finding of no private enrollment. So to sum, of the 54 institutions that were included in this review, 45 have received a nonprofit classification, five, maybe four, remain under review, one school closed since May, and three out-of-state campuses have ceased operations in Maryland and therefore no longer uh, this review is no longer required for them. And a full list of the institutions is included in the appendix of this report. Uh, in reviewing all the reportable incidents, staff have identified several best practices that institutions may consider in implementing to protect against private inurement. We realized that there were some, I don't wanna say gray areas, but some spaces where we're like, well, it's not really private environment, but if you had some additional documentation, it would, it would make us all feel a lot better. Uh, so things like institutions should develop and have readily available detailed conflict of interest policies covering all transactions with disqualified persons. 
And this, the, this document should be provided to those individuals for awareness and compliance. Institutions should regularly conduct a thorough review of potential transactions with disqualified people, including a consideration of all possible alternatives to entering into that transaction. Institutions should regularly allow for, if not require, the recusal of disqualified persons from discussions or votes regarding the potential transaction. And institutions should keep contemporaneous documentation that the conflict of interest policy was followed, including documentation of an investigation of and discussion regarding alternatives. So next steps. Uh, as noted, this was our first time uh, doing this kind of review. We've learned a number of lessons in the process, uh, and therefore we're considering revisions to the regulations and the forms. For example, we are considering changes to the reporting period to align with an institution's fiscal year and not the calendar year. Uh, additional and more specific questions regarding reportable incidents will likely be added to the form which should greatly reduce the amount of time necessary for follow-up communications. And certain types of reportable incidents, such as standard tuition remission offered to all employee family members may be excluded from reporting. So we are considering uh, regulatory changes and form updates. Um, in light of these kind of potential changes, uh, we have recommended that the next reporting cycle be postponed until these changes are made and regulatory amendments are drafted and finalized. And the institutions have been notified of this postponement. I do want to give a shout out, as Secretary Fielder noted, uh, we do have Bryson Barksdale on, on the line. He has been our education analyst that has been working through this. And some of you might recognize him as our uh, student commissioner from a few years back that we have since hired. <laughs> so he's been great and has really led the charge in working with our institutions on some really complex matters. Um, I also just want to give a quick shout out. So Makadia um, has been integral in this process. Of course, Trish uh, has been uh, kind of leading the way as well, and Karen King Sheridan. And then I think we also have our contact with uh, consumer protection, Chris Medeo, on the line as well. So this has required a lot of people and a lot of discussions and a lot of thoughtfulness uh, to really look at how our institutions are operating and uh, whether or not they are doing things that benefit uh, individuals as opposed to the educational interest of the institution. I will stop there and happy to answer questions that uh, I may pass off to other people. <laughs> Uh, one quick question and then one observation that I would just love your feedback on. So the question is, I think, probably straightforward. How do you become aware of a reportable incident? Do you find them or do they self-report or do they come over the transom from some like a whistleblower? So they self-report and we use the basis, I believe, and I'm going to miss uh, misquote the form, but there's an IRS form uh, that we use the basis for reportable incidents. Any nonprofit organization is expected to submit this form, um, and so we use that as as the basis. Got it. Okay. the The comment, and feel free to disregard this or pass it off or whatever. This seems like a sudden and significant new burden on MHEC. Um, yes. If the legislation just passed and suddenly you have to figure out how to do the research on and then identify the possible bad actors and then work with another state entity to figure this out. Um, obviously, there are kinks in any new system, but is this the kind of thing that uh, the MHEC got additional staff in order to work for or the kind of thing that you could envision going back to the legislature and saying, this is too burdensome or we need to change this in some way? Yeah, so oh, go ahead, Secretary. No, I was just going to say that's a, that's a very very astute observation. When this was introduced, uh, we were not supportive as a department because of the complexities for an institution like Johns Hopkins that has hundreds of of private institutes, the research and development groups um, that are associated with the university. It becomes quite burdensome for them to sort through, let alone for us to prepare not having someone who's uh, an actuarial analyst or a tax analyst and for us to and bryson's done a great job of diving into this and understanding 
what we needed to do. But the downside of this, if we found that the institution was not, it has tremendous tax and administrative ramifications for the institution. The original legislation was passed requiring it as an annual burden. Mikua, um, Sarah Fidler, before her, the executive director and president, all were opposed to the timelines and said, well, at least if we're going to kick it off, let's, let's have it every couple years. But that did not pass either. So this, this will still take some more dialogue. Um, we'll do what we can with the flexibility of our regulations but would look for legislative support if it's necessary, because it is, it's a burden and to take uh, someone in any staff position at any department and ask them to become a deep specialist uh, without a couple of years worth of training and education is risk, risking the very purpose of the legislation. Mm -hmm. Not that the person can't learn it fast enough, it's just there's no way if someone is intent upon avoiding um, being observed that that doesn't happen. And you know, these reports require the, the highest executive approvals before they're submitted to us at each institution. So we have to rely on, on that being a major factor also. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that this actually doesn't have any impl Im implications beyond MHEC and the consumer protection laws. So it doesn't actually affect their tax status or anything like that, but there are potential other federal implications like the, the Department of Education could potentially take it into account. Um, so it, it, you know, it only affects them in terms of laws that MHEC administers and the Consumer Protection administers that apply to them. But yes, there's still potential other um, implications. Mm -hmm. so I have a question. Is there um, a similar review of public institutions and similar legislation, and so that this is just new for the independent sector? It is just new for the, yeah, for the non-public sector. Um, I don't want to speak for the legislature, but I think that there is assumption that the public auditors that go through um, public review of, of public entities uh, would, would evaluate uh, these kinds of transactions. So there is no similar review like you're doing for the public's? No, not within our agency. I will also add that there, um, particularly in 2018, uh, looking back historically from you know, 2010 to 2016, 2017, uh, there was a lot of energy around for-profit activity and particularly that for profits were converting into nonprofits um, as a way to get around requirements as being a for profit. Um, so we've heard the term for benefit um, as as a way uh, that some of some campuses, particularly Kaplan uh, University, uh, in their acquisition under Purdue, uh, is now a for benefit entity. We we don't make those that kind of distinction here, but trying to ensure that if an institution as it is in fact a non-profit entity is doing things in the interest uh, that is of the educational interest of that institution. Mm -hmm. so there, there is that kind, otherwise we were just taking an institution on their word um, that they were in fact a non-profit entity. This gives us a little bit of insight in terms of their financial transactions and uh, you know, their, their actual doings uh, inconsistent with that nonprofit mission. However, uh, Chair Secretary Fielder, just as you both noted, uh, there have been, uh, <laughs> this has been a heavy lift for staff um, and it's new territory for MHEC. Um, there have been certainly some challenges in working with institutions in terms of the purpose of this review, uh, the value of the review. Uh, we have um, reviewed documents that institutions uh, have questioned confidentiality. So we have uh, implemented procedures so that uh, board meeting minutes could be redacted and only the uh, only the, the transaction that we're interested in is, is visible, um, uh, keeping donors anonymous. Um, so it's it's required some uh, some some really unique thinking uh, and collaboration with the institutions really uh, on this kind of review. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Dow, I, I agree with you. It's a heavy lift, but it sounds like it's an important one. I have one question related to this institution with 23 incidents of violations. What is their status now? Uh, so I believe if I'm remembering correctly, that inst that one particular institution is continue is under review. Um, so I, I, I don't want to speak on the status uh, right now. Uh, I, I will share that, uh, and this isn't particular to that institution, but is a more general response. Uh, as I, I kind of noted earlier, a lot of the efforts has been uh, going back to the institution for more information. So as you can probably imagine, the institutions were very concrete and only gave us exactly what we asked for. Um, so they would give us some information and that would create more questions for us. And, we would need more documentation or more evidence. And so then we go back to them. And so uh, some of these institutions, we've had ongoing weekly conversations and emails back and forth requesting clarification or additional documentation. Um, and so with 23 reportable incidents, um, that has been, uh, because then they would give, you know, we would get some more information and then that would make us <laughs> look back at an earlier incident that we were reviewing. Uh, so it's it's been a bit of back and forth. Thank you. So I have a question um, and maybe a comment, and I agree this must have been a tremendous amount of work that is uh, new and outside of a traditional types of tasks that you take on. Uh, I'm just curious if, you know, doing this 50 times and since you, you, you <laughs> interviewed 50 companies, did you, did you develop like, um, you know, um, interview sheets? Did you have maybe audit programs to say, okay, these are the things we're going to explore? Have you been able to, and I realize that it's new, have you been able to begin to standardize it so that maybe it's a little bit more, it's a little bit clearer? And, you know, when certain things pop up, like, you know, if you see something, you know, okay, it's probably something behind that. So just from a compliance standpoint, I'm just curious how the process works. Absolutely, and, and that's actually our motivation for delaying the next review is we, we kind of want to get our ducks in a row for exactly that reason. Um, so for example, the tuition, re, the tuition remission or reimbursement policies that many campuses have, if they have that policy for all employees and all staff members, then that really isn't something right. we necessarily need to Absolutely. review. Um, but going into this, we didn't realize that. So yes, we, we need to develop, we have those kind of uh, anecdotally, but developing those policy documents, uh, revising our forms so that we ask far more targeted questions, uh, and of course, revising the regulations so that we can uh, better, better align the regulatory process with not only capacity, but what is realistic to what the institutions actually do. Dr. Dow, I have a question. Um, have there been any concerns about um, institutions not disclosing reportable incidents? And um, if so, like what sort of process for that? Sure. So again, we lean on that IRS document. Um, so we are we are putting all of our eggs in the basket that if they are not reporting to us, then they are certainly not reporting to the federal government, um, which obviously has potentially more significant uh, ramifications. Um, the challenges that we're facing in terms of uh, institutions working with us is providing uh, follow-up information or follow-up documentation. So as I said, institutions answered the question we asked. So if we did not ask the right question, we needed to go back to them and ask them for more information to get at what we were trying to get at. So things, like I said, we were reviewing things like board meeting minutes. Um, if there was a contract that a board member was involved with, we wanted to make sure that it was at market value. How do we assess market value? What does that mean? Just to ensure that nobody was getting a huge contract that was well above market value. Um, so, you know, they would, an institution would give us the contract, but then we'd have to go back and say, well, how do we know that this was at market value? And what, what evidence did your board do to ensure that it was at market value? So it was, it's those kinds of back and forth um, 
that have been interesting to navigate. Trish, I don't know if you want to add anything or Soma. Um, I just wanted to say that I think with any new process, year one, that it is um, a learning experience for all of us, but by and large, most of the institutions responded in a way that they felt was appropriate. And our interactions with them were to clarify what we needed. Um, I do think by and large that they were forthcoming with their information and supply documents. Um, we did have to clarify quite a few times um, with institutions. Um, there, there really wasn't a concern um, in large with not reporting um, reportable incidents. It was more so clarifying the definition and who was contained within that group. Um, and I do believe the form you're referring to is the form 990 that we um, reviewed for the reportable incidents. So by and large, most individual, most institutions were reporting, um, they, they're reporting aligned with that form. So, and I would think maybe like, like the next reporting period or even the, uh, the reporting period after that, we'll probably get to a point where we are more smooth with the process. But as we look at institutions and reportable incidents, it brings up new scenarios. So we're, we're constantly identifying new situations and best practices. And that's something that Bryson and Soma have been very good at helping us to catalog all of these items so that we can help reduce the reporting on the institution side. Well, thank you for all of that. My only final comment, and I'd love to hear what the other commissioners think about this, is um, I think we as a commission probably have some sort of authority to at least in whatever kind of circumstances um, send a letter to the legislature if MHEC makes a decision that this program isn't working, it just isn't being implemented the way maybe the legislature wanted because of staffing concerns or the burden is too high or whatever else it might be. So it sounds like you're handling it expertly at this point, but if at some point in the future you realize it could be done a better way, but it requires a legislative fix, I certainly would be open to the idea of um, do we as a commission need to send some sort of let, letter to the legislature just alerting them to they had the best of intentions, but there might be a better way of bringing this about. Uh, that's just an offer that I'm making if the other commissioners uh, agree we can put it in abeyance until it becomes necessary. But anytime I see a new reporting requirement like this, sometimes I recognize that the legislature might not always know exactly what the implementation will cost. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we will, uh, we're, we're certainly, I, and I want to, in some ways, foreshadow that in the coming months, you will likely see regulatory changes uh, put forth before the commission related to this review process for all those changes that we just discussed. Um, so we'll start with our regulatory review, but certainly um, Soma has her finger on the pulse in terms of the statutory obligation, and I'm sure she will uh, make recommendations appropriately if, if we think that legislative change is, is needed. Thank you. I appreciate that support. and. Um, I'm, I'm certain that staff appreciate it as well. Terrific. Well, so I'll just leave it in your court, uh, probably Secretary Fielder, when you think this is, needs to come back to an agenda item, let us know um, and we can take it up again there. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners on this matter? Okay, is there one final item or was that the last one, uh, Dr. Fielder? Um, well, we have one more item that's an update from Emily on the state plan, and then I'd like to take a few minutes to brief uh, the commission on our efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Dow, you're up. Yes. Sure. So, let me uh, share my screen. Hopefully, yep, I... Can someone just confirm that they can see the slides? We can see them, yes. Yeah, okay, fabulous, great. So this is an update on uh, the drafting of the next iteration of the state plan. Uh, you might remember that this is a, a four-year plan that uh, our next iteration is due uh, July 1st, 2021. Uh, we've had a number of work groups meet over the summer. They provided recommendations. 
in our November commission meeting, I provided a, a bit of an overview in terms of structure, uh, information. So what I'd like to share with you today is uh, our currently drafted priorities uh, for the 2021-2025 state plan. So you might remember, uh, we're, uh, as, as outlined right now, uh, we will have uh, essentially five sections, but the first four sections will be an introduction, uh, a section on a progress uh, regarding our existing goals and existing strategies and action items. Uh, we will include a section specific to the pandemic and how higher education, at, at least in Maryland, if not nationally, um, has shifted uh, that will probably dra be drafted towards as we get closer to July 1st so that it can be as contemporary as possible. But I'm sure you can imagine all the changes that may or may not stick uh, in light of, of campus operations and how higher education has been uh, working in the past nine to nine to 10 months. Almost 12 months. Oh, my gosh, it was March. Um, <laughs> Then we will have a section specific to equity um, and a, a, an equity statement, if you will, and uh, really creating an equity framework or lens for the 2021-2025 uh, state plan. Um, and that equity will really explicitly be weaved in through all of the priorities um, and that it merits a standalone section uh, talking about ways our institutions, the state, um, departments, anybody in higher education can really take on an equity approach uh, and think through that. So again, what I'd like to propose uh, or like to discuss and present to you today uh, are the uh, revised priorities uh, in our, our current iteration, the 2017 to 21 state plan, we call them strategies, but I am recommending that we call them priorities for the next iteration. I think that's a better term. Um, because it, it is just that. It is a priority within a goal uh, and things that, again, the state and institutions need to be focusing on. So you might remember uh, we have our three goals, student access, ensuring equitable access to affordable and quality post-secondary education for all Marylanders, student success, promote and implement practices and policies that will ensure student success, and innovation foster innovation in all aspects of Maryland higher education to improve access and student success. So those are our three goals, access, success, and innovation. Within each goal, we will, oh, I'm so sorry. So again, just to reiterate, so we will have a section on student access, a section on student success, there will be priorities, action items articulated in each of these sections. Innovation is going to cut through all of both of these sections. So instead of having a complete 100% standalone section on innovation, there's going to be innovative priorities and innovative action items within the student access and student success, success sections. I will provide some examples in a minute of what I mean by that. And then, of course, we do have kind of one action item that kind of sits outside of access and success and is innovative as a whole. And then on top of that, we have the whole equity framework and again, explicit statements throughout the document that will have action items specific to uh, addressing issues around equity, diversity and inclusion. So back to what I am trying to tell you today. Sorry, that was a lot of background information. Priorities are new priorities. So for the first goal, student access. Uh, our first priority will be study the affordability of post-secondary education. Much of, the write, much of the work of the writing groups, whether it was student access specifically or even student success and innovation, just lots of questions about what it means to have an affordable college degree. We all recognize, uh, the writing groups recognize that it costs money to, to do higher education, um, but what does that mean and what does it mean to be affordable? Um, so some of the action items that I have drafted are things like looking into uh, the U.S. Department of Education just recently announced uh, some tax benefits uh, to companies that help pay down student loans when they employ somebody. Um, so how do we how do we actualize that and how do we integrate that as an affordability initiative and study the impact uh, of what that would mean for our students and for our higher education institutions? 
There are some examples of that already existing uh, throughout uh, the nation, some smaller institutions that are doing things like uh, uh, a tuition based on uh, your income once you graduate. Uh, another kind of innovative idea under this priority is considering doing away with the 12 to 18 credit range for full-time status. Um, and what does that mean for affordability? Um, so priority one, study the affordability of post-secondary education. Priority two, examine and improve financial literacy programs for students and families to encourage financial planning and pay for post-secondary education. This is a little bit of a carryover from uh, our current state plan. Uh, the writing groups uh, felt that this needed to remain, that there is kind of a, an issue around financial literacy and simple things like what's the difference between a loan and a grant? Um, what's the difference between getting federal aid from the US government versus getting aid from uh, another entity? Uh, so, an equity issue here um, that will be highlighted is that we really need to be educating all students on how to best pay for college prior to enrollment. We need to think about, um, sure, a high school may be able to offer a how to pay for college evening on a Thursday night, but what about the working families that can't show up on a Thursday night? And so how do we think through that in terms of getting the information out to our students? Um, and out to their families so that they can adequately financially plan. Um, another uh, uh, action item that, that I have drafted in this section is um, looking at LARP programs, loan assistant repayment programs, and uh, ensuring that students are aware of those, that when a student enrolls in a specific program, that there may be an opportunity if they continue employment in the state, that that loan gets repaid or partially repaid based on their employment. So some examples. A third priority uh, in our student access group is evaluate and improve systems that inform and evaluate a student's academic readiness for post-secondary education. Again, the writing groups recognize that college readiness is an issue in terms of academic preparedness. Um, and that that is an access issue for, for students to really enter those front doors of an institution. Our community colleges are open access institutions, but our four-year institutions often use uh, admissions requirements as ways to identify college readiness. Uh, so we have slightly different uh, ways of uh, identifying uh, college readiness and what that means for students. So again, an explicit equity issue here is to really take, kind of take a statewide approach around what we mean when we talk about college readiness, and in some ways teasing that apart from admissions criteria uh, that may be specific to an institution's mission. Um, another uh, equity or uh, action item uh, specific to this priority is dual enrollment and access to dual enrollment. Um, we know that that is often a gateway for students to be able to access uh, post-secondary education while enrolled in, in high school. So those are just some examples. The fourth priority for, uh, for access is analyze other systems that either benefit or prohibit specific student populations from accessing affordable and quality post-secondary education. And this really kind of, a lot of this discussion um, from the writing group stems from kind of the immediate uh, changes that have happened in light of the pandemic. So having, you know, trying to think creatively about schedules, um, daytime classes versus evening classes, and that a student may very well say, well, I can't do that because I need to be a full-time student. And that kind of prohibits them from accessing post-secondary education. Um, so uh, one of the writing groups uh, noted, uh, this is about serving, uh, serving the students we have, not the students we want. Um, which is a very different approach to higher education than I think uh, has typically been founded. So analyzing other systems um, that either benefit or prohibit um, that are not otherwise discussed in uh, the first three priorities. Uh, some other examples, things like education de uh, deserts, leveraging the regional higher education centers that we have and bringing the education to the student as opposed to bringing the student to the education, things like that. Uh, in terms of the access. 
I will stop there and take a quick breath before I move on to the second goal. Any questions, comments, thoughts on those priorities? And please know that I welcome, I, I'm continuing to draft um, as we go, I'll, get, I'll provide some next steps on the final slide, but uh, please know that if you have thoughts about any of this after this meeting, please feel free to email me. Um, I welcome uh, discussions on this uh, or your thoughts. I know I'm kind of handing this off to you without much uh, uh, notice. Well, thank you for all your work on this questions, comments, thoughts. Yeah, I just, uh, John Yeager here. I just had one comment on the um, the forty affordability. You know, I think it's it's implied that it's directed at the student, but there's also a question of affordability of the state, or maybe it's more that we cannot afford to uh, invest in education. But that's always an issue as well. How much will the state invest in in there? But uh, again, I just am trying to confirm. We're really talking about uh potential students the affordability for them to participate in post-secondary education correct yeah that's uh that's yeah how it is currently currently drafted yeah but uh, that's an interesting point worth noting uh about uh we can't afford to not invest uh, as a state as a public uh, good uh not invest in higher education post-secondary education I just have one comment. Um, it's nice to hear you say that you are addressing the students that you have and not the ideal students that should be or you want. Yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to not use that phrase multiple times because I think it's a really powerful uh, statement. So thank you for that. I agree. So with that, let me move on to our second goal, uh, student success. Um, and uh, I think we have three priorities uh, in, in this uh, section. So priority five would be maintaining a commitment to high quality post-secondary education in Maryland. Again, this is a bit of a carryover from our current plan. The writing group felt that it needed to remain as a priority. It was previously noted as a strategy. Um, but in this section, uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, academic programs, meeting industry changes. Uh, our innovation group suggested uh, some new and novel ways to uh, bridge that gap between post-secondary education and higher and industry um, at the state level, not just at the institution level. Um, and identifying regional and statewide need for the next four to ten years. Uh, you know, we, we didn't have drones uh, 15 years ago, or if we did, we didn't have the educational training uh, in the formal sense that we do now. And now we have several institutions that are providing uh, unmanned aircraft programs. Um, so thinking ahead of what's going to be the technology of tomorrow and what are those industry changes that our institutions can start doing program development. And that's only going to happen if our higher ed institutions are talking to industry. Um, also included in this priority is supporting all of our institutions, particularly institutions with unique missions. Um, and also included in this is supporting our faculty and faculty development and training and pedagogy. Uh, one carryover that is in the current state plan that will carry over is encouraging graduate student training and pedagogy and the teaching. Uh, because those are professionals that could come back to higher ed and, and teach a course or two, if not uh, teach professionally uh, with their expertise. And so kind of training that next generation of faculty members, I think, is important. Um, a second or yeah, the sixth priority, second priority for the student success goal is improve systems that prevent timely completion of an academic program. Again, this is a bit of a carryover from our current state plan. Transfer remains an issue. Uh, our innovation group uh, spent quite a bit of time writing some information around uh, ideas of how to improve the transfer process between institutions for a student. Um, so that will be included. Um, also included here is expanding credit for prior learning policies. We Institutions have this. Uh, in place often, but it may not be standardized. 
We also have some regulatory uh, uh, regulatory options that institutions can take advantage of for credit for prior learning. So expanding that, and if you have a student who can do some basic algebra, don't put them in Algebra 101, uh, test them and make sure that they can test out of that um, so that they can move on to, to the next appropriate level. Uh, the third priority uh, in, uh, this, in the Student Success Goal is enhancing the ways post-secondary education is a space for ongoing uh, life learning. <clears throat> Again, this kind of stems from a, a bit of the innovation group, but also uh, the Student Success Group as well, and is a bit of an innovative way of thinking about higher education that, um, particularly in light of potential foreshadowing of enrollment declines in the next 10 years uh, due to just population decreases. Uh, thinking about the purpose of higher education for somebody who already has their undergrad degree or already has a certificate, um, that really this is not just uh, a one-time one stop uh, for individuals, but individuals can go back for continuing education, for professional development. Also included uh, in this priority uh, is uh, a, a push for civic engagement, um, that higher education, post-secondary education is an opportunity for individuals to uh, be, learn how to be citizens and be uh, productive members of society. Uh, so I will stop there. Those are our three priorities for student success. Any questions, comments, thoughts, things to think about? Comments, questions? Nothing for me. Okay, so I will move on. And so the innovation group, um, the innovation goal, as I've noted, innovation, instead of it being kind of a standalone, it's going to be weaved throughout, just like equity is weaved throughout and will be uh, identified old and big. Um, so it may feel like innovation is a little bit lacking, but it's not. Um, and I will make sure that that is articulated well. Um, but really innovation is leveraging what is unique to Maryland and what Maryland can offer nationally and to each other. Um, and so of course in this section we'll do a summary of innovative ideas presented in the earlier priorities and action items. But one priority that will be specific to innovation that again the writing group uh, felt what we needed to keep was promote a culture of risk taking. And so of course this uh, includes um, uh, trying to figure out innovative ways that solve problems. Um, obviously, first identifying that problem. This has to uh, incorporate an equity framework that when you look at a problem, you've got to think about everybody that it's impacting um, and also requires evaluation metrics. Um, so continuing, because if we don't, if we keep doing it the same way we're doing it, we, we are likely not serving everybody. We likely are perpetuating systemic uh, discrimination and we're not providing solutions that uh, serve the, the world of tomorrow. So thinking through uh, risk taking uh, as a way to solve problems. Okay, so to, uh, to sum, again, five sections. Uh, we'll also have a glossary um, which would be new to this iteration, uh, just to clarify some terms. Um, and so next steps and timelines. So uh, that first bullet point, outline of new priorities and action items. Uh, so any feedback that you have on these, please let me know. I welcome them. Uh, what I hope to be able to do is provide a full draft, uh, words and all, of the new priorities at our February commission meeting for approval and to circulate for public comment. Again, we have the writing groups um, provide lots and lots of text and ideas, um, but this will be a much more formal public comment opportunity. Uh, I'm hoping for mid-March, uh, so a two week period. Uh, and then at the March meeting, I can provide a summary of comments. At the April meeting, revisions, May meeting, final review, and June uh, approval. So with that, I will stop. And that is my update on state plan uh, drafting. Thank you, Dr. Dow. Uh, questions, comments, Dr. Fielder, anything you'd like to add? 
And now I just want to make sure that the the slides are sent out to each of the commission members if they have not received them already. Um, yes, I will make sure. I apologize. Yes. No, no, there's no need to apologize. We went through these a couple of days ago and it, there's a lot going on. And when you think of innovation, just think of higher ed 18 months ago. Think of K-12 system 18 months ago. And think of, of the tremendous amount of people who now really appreciate teachers. You know, the ones that are, are working full time and trying to teach their children at home. And the, the innovation through IT, what does it really mean? You know, the sharing of information and document, it just expands and multiplies the learning so much faster. So what do we do with that? As an example, um, if you think of the HBCU bill, the 557 million over 10 years, what if the University of Maryland Global Campus was the one to provide the pipeline since they've been doing the pipeline of, of courses all over the world for 70 years? So instead of each one of the HBCUs having to build their own infrastructure, if we just said, hey, why don't we just broaden the pipeline? You know, it'll be there. You know, each individual HBCU will have their courses and their revenue stream and built out by the, the pipeline owner, which is UMGC. So those kinds of things are things that we can think about through our plan on how to continue to expand and serve and reduce the cost and speed up education. So it all, it all fits together in some way. Dr. Dow, I did have a, a general question about the state plan. Um, I would think that um, each individual university or institution of higher learning develops its own strategic plan for the year or for the next couple of years. Um, what ties the state plan concepts uh, to an individual university plan? Excellent, excellent question. You want me to go, Emily, first and you can follow up? Sure, no it, problem. It all falls together, the state plan and then the mission statements. The mission statement is prepared by each institution, their executives and their individual boards and faculty members put together their mission statement. Their mission statement includes their academic programs that they request. So it's kind of like building the permit. The academic programs have to be congruent with the institutional mission statement. Their mission statement has to be reviewed by MHEC every four years in conjunction with our state plan to make sure that their, their, their mission is congruent with our state plan. So it, it, it fits together in, in that manner. It's a little bit of a loose translation, but that's the intent of it. Yeah, uh, just to thank you, Secretary. I, I'll just probably repeat what you just said. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, just as Secretary mentioned, uh, we do a review of mission statements for public institutions. We do not do it for uh, the non-public institutions, uh, but all the public institutions, they have an opportunity to revise their mission statements in that review, we ask them to provide their strategic plan, uh, align their strategic plan with the state plan as appropriate. Um, and then just as Secretary Fielder mentioned, uh, during the program review process, we ask institutions to identify how this program development aligns with the state plan. So okay. in one of those priorities around high quality education, when we talk about market demand, we really need to give uh, the institution some guidance of what we need uh, with 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 the need of, of new programs in the state of Maryland. Um, the, the other kind of tie into all of this is uh, often uh, Jeff Newman, when uh, he leads the discussion around budgets uh, at that large, long September meeting, um, they often, uh, those budget discussions and budget presentations are intended to align with the state plan. Um, to talk about budget requests as they uh, pertain to, to the priorities and the goals. And one other element of it, uh, Chuck, that's a really good question, is that each of you as commissioners plays a role in this when we have an academic program request and review, um, because as part of our examination as to whether there's a unique mission at an individual institution when another one wants to offer it, 
and those come before you for a final after we make a decision and a recommendation if, if one of the institutions appeals. Um, so that's again a congruence of, is it congruent with the mission and what if an institution wakes up tomorrow morning and says, you know what, we want to be nanotechnology, we want to be data analytics, we want to be global computing, we want to be cloud, you know, all these things. Well, how does that go about if it's not congruent with a, a mission statement that they have and it's not based in the science program they already have? So all these things fit together. Um, a little bit of dynamic tension occurs and that's okay, but that's part of it. The, so the other thing I might add, and this is very global, but speaking of the not-for-profit sector, both public and, well, public is obviously not-for-profit and, and independent, I can't imagine that there's an institution that isn't focused on access, success, and innovation. I think that's just central to the way everybody's operating and focused these days. Now, uh, well, thank you for that. And it, it's amazing how many times we hear that. We do. It's interesting when we meet with individual institutions and we start talking about why the new academic program and the word revenue, revenue, revenue is used and versus student, student success, you know, expansion of the workforce. And so it's, it, it's, it's a fine line to try to balance that out. But Mary Pat, that's an excellent observation. All right, anything else on this? I will get the slides out or I will send them to, to Debbie um, for distribution. Thank you, Dr. Dow. Thank you. All right, Secretary Fielder. Uh, yes, I just want to uh, spend just a few minutes. Um, the last eight months of the work within the department and with a couple of the commissioners on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and uh, an attempt to uh, review, listen carefully, and, and move the department forward in the review of each uh, and look at do we have systematic racism? Is it embedded in our regulations? Is it embedded in financial aid? Is it in our academic programs? Is it at every institution? And if so, what do we do about it? So the first thought was it can be in a small group, and so we've had a couple discussions, and out of that grew the the evident need to provide some training for the full MX staff. So we've had two sessions so far. The first one was um, Milton Hunt. You also did the first and the second one. The first one was aimed more at um, employee engagement, working remotely, those types of things. Um, the second one we finished just three weeks ago or so. It seems longer, but about that was on unconscious bias uh, work through that. So the next one will be a little bit broader back on more of the diversity and equity. And I really appreciate the two commission members who've been participating with me and some staff and thinking through the approach to use. Um, again, the effort is to make sure that we are providing that success and access and using innovation using outside speakers as necessary, reviewing literature and so forth. So the goal here is to make sure that when we have and we do serve an extremely broad and diverse population in the state that all feel welcome and, and are engaged in a manner that moves everybody forward. So I just wanted to kind of give you that update and, and this anybody who would like to participate in these going forward, we certainly will. Well, thank you for that, and uh, especially that last point. So, um, if there are members of the commission who want to participate in these, join in some of your work groups, who would be open to any and all of that? Yes, I mean it's welcomed because we need different perspectives. That's terrific. I know everybody's busy and has lots of MHEC and other responsibilities. So, um, if anyone has the time and inclination to do that. Uh, that would be terrific, and thank you for making it open to members of the commission. I know I appreciate that, and I'm sure others do too. Any uh, questions, thoughts on any of the above? Okay, good. Well, let me just take one last pass through the agenda. I think we hit everything. Uh, Secretary Fielder, 
is there anything else we need to cover or members of the commission do you think we missed anything our next meeting february 24th and i think each of you had seen the schedule for the year that we've laid out knowing that may change as the pandemic causes changes and workload changes things but the intent is to try to have that out there as far in advance as we can so yeah the 24th and then it's uh what page is that on the next page to the last page, page. 14, page 14 i think it is in my book um do you have that and, and again anytime any of you think of something or see something that needs to be addressed I'm available by phone. I'm av available by, uh, I'd love to say in person meetings. I most enjoy those, but if we have to revert to emails and texts, we can. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Any other commissioners for the good of the order before we wrap up? All right. Well, uh, First of all, thank you to Secretary Fielder. Thank you to your entire team for walking us through this. Thank you to the commissioners uh, for their attention and dedication to all of this work. If there's nothing else, if someone wants to make a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Take that, second. Commissioner Coleman. Uh, second, second from uh, Commissioner <laughs> McDaniels or Sir Camp. All right, very good. Um, all in favor of adjournment. Uh, all right. Uh, Anyone opposed? All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, stay safe. Over, I'll talk. To you. Yep. Uh, and see you all next month. Yes. Stay safe. What's up, Johnny?